You're listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Not so bad. Yourself? Good, good. Um, I know you haven't been outside of your house in a while, but I'm assuming you do have windows, and I'm wondering, do you have any leaves left on your tree? No, those are long gone. We uh, we 86 the leaves, I want to say, two or three weeks ago, and yes, 86 is a restaurant term. That is my background, bartending, restaurant management. I had a whole career in restaurants before I even got into identity and access management, which a lot of people find surprising. You have a long heritage in authorization then, right? <laughs> Definitely authorization. Credentials, you know how to authorize people. Like, wow, all right, I see. Fraud is another thing out there, so. Oh yeah. So there's a voice you just heard, that's Ian Glazer. He is the co-founder and vice president of ID Pro, and we're very lucky and happy to have him on. So welcome to the show, Ian. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so restaurant, uh, my restaurant experience definitely is all-encompassing. I think I've done it all in a restaurant and sometimes even all in the same shift. <laughs> so um, I think that's where it comes. Uh, you know, you talk about authorizations, and I my first experience with identity fraud actually came in the restaurant business. So I know we're going to get into a couple other conversations. We want to talk about ID Pro and talk about identity predictions, but I got to share this story real quick. Um, I was working as a manager uh, of a of a pub and brewery, very upscale place. And my first experience with identity fraud was when one of my servers took the credit card from the guests to pay for their bill as as most places would do here in the US. In the Europe, it's a little bit different. Typically, they bring the machine out to you and then you put your card in and then you pay there. But in the US, you give your card to the uh, server or whoever it may be, and they then go off and do their thing and then come back. Well, uh, our um, establishment happened to be very close to a Best Buy. So our server handed off their credit card for their guest, gave it to their boyfriend, who went into Best Buy and purchased several thousand dollars worth of TVs uh, and then returned the card back to the server, who then provided it back to the guest along with their check for, for their meal. Um, so that was my first experience. You want some fries with that? Like that's a, whew. Right. Um, and, you know, we established the time frame around behind it around, okay, these purchases were made. Apparently the card was it, you know, the, the individual was at the, uh, you know, the establishment. I'll, I'll, I'll protect uh, the names uh, around that. But that was my first experience with uh, identity fraud that I can think of way back in the day. And that would have been, oof. 20 years ago. <laughs> and apparently incident response as well. Like, you know, good on you for doing the, the forensics afterwards. Yeah, we had, you know, you had to keep all the audit trails behind the credit cards, all that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that's my side story here on identity fraud, which is, I think is a great way to start off 2021 because, you know, <laughs> it's so prevalent, you know, um, <laughs> we're actually recording this in December of 2020, but I can't imagine the world will change drastically over the next couple of weeks here while we're on a break. Oh, you didn't just say that out loud. The yeah, hell I did. I'm thinking? pulling down the fourth wall because that's that's how we roll. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think there's no better way to start <laughs> identity fraud in 2021. I think it's fitting. Um, so, so welcome to the show, Ian, with all that. I think um, one of the things that would be interesting uh, to talk through here as we get into ID Pro and some of the future of identity, though, is... Uh, we have kind of a traditional first question of how did you get into identity and access management? Is this something that chose you or did you choose it? Uh, so it's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to have me come in and chat with you guys. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so my origin story actually has two parts. The first part is my first job out of college was I was a pre-sales engineer for Oracle. Classic sort of database, um, web app servers were kind of newish at the time. And towards the end of my time at Oracle, uh, Oracle released the its directory server. And a friend of mine tried to install it and was completely thwarted. Uh, the direct quote was, it was the only piece of software that ever made her cry. And I was like, what the, wow, what is this thing? So I went and tried to install it and it was a bear to install. It was horrible. And then I got it running and I'm like, what? Now, now what? Right, because I had been steeped in like SQL, and all of a sudden I had like LDAP to contend with, and I was just like, I, I, I don't know what I do with this thing. Okay, scene closes. 
a couple months later, my boss gets recruited, or sorry, the guy who's covering sales in my region got recruited by a user provisioning company, it happened to be Access 360, which was one of the really early user provisioning companies back in the day when like BMC Control SA was a big deal and whatnot. Well, he got recruited and he's like, look, this company's recruiting me. And this is like the height of the dot-com bubble. He's like, I don't, I don't get all the technology. Would you mind coming out with me to SoCal and kind of be my BS sensor? I was too young and stupid to realize that I was also being recruited at the time. Like, yeah, good job. Uh, and it turns out that I ended up uh, being offered and taking a position as sale, field sort of field sales engineer and consultant and a bunch of other stuff at Access 360. And, and so I started in user provisioning properly, my little foray into directory services notwithstanding. And I don't know. It liked, I, I liked it. It liked me. I don't know. It was like a good chocolate and peanut butter thing. And I kind of stuck with it. And so from there, um, got to see more of the industry. We got acquired by IBM, which put, you know, me in a much bigger company with a little kind of different opportunities. I got the opportunity to move into product management, got the opportunity to work with analysts at that time. And uh, from IBM, I went to a network-based access control company, which was putting identity into packets themselves, which didn't really pan out, but I learned a ton, especially from a debugging perspective. Like, if you can debug wacky, strange network stuff, you can debug almost anything. Um, moved from that into a company that was doing uh, governance, risk, and compliance, sort of at the height of the segregation of duties, SOX compliance kind of world, and I built a bunch of identity stuff there, plus a segregation of duties engine. Uh, and then finally, after years of like going, sort of trying to figure out how to get in, uh, joined Burton Group, which was an analyst firm. Uh, and known for identity and security uh, research. We got bought by Gartner uh, and um, spent a bunch of time there. Uh, and then I joined, which my current employer, Salesforce, almost seven years ago uh, to help look after some of the identity products. So winding, a winding path, but I played a lot of different roles around identity products. Um, and um, I'm really grateful for that because I got, Honestly, I got to see the world uh, and meet some amazing people all over the place and, and see some amazing customers uh, and help them with their success. So yeah, I'm deeply appreciative of the opportunities I've had. That's a pretty well-rounded background. And I'm curious around, especially the time that you spent between Burton and Gartner, um, you know, both obviously very well-known research firms around identity. What's it like to work on that side of the fence where you know, you're, you're perceived as thought leadership, but also, you know, investigating trends and companies, maybe even examples, yeah. right? You know, for, for better or worse, the Gartner Magic Quadrant is kind of seen as the, either the end all be all or the starting point for most product decisions in the IT space. Um, again, for better or worse, but what's it like to be kind of part of that, that side of the fence? So uh, when I joined Burton, I got to join an amazing team of identity practitioners. Uh, these are some people, one of whom is still my mentor, like just amazing folks in terms of the ability to think about a problem space and its implications for customers. So I would say the first thing about being an analyst is it's terrifying because people think you're the analyst. I mean, sorry, people think you're the expert. And um, if you're just starting out, like, yeah, sure, you brought some stuff to the table, but to be the expert in, say, access certification, which was one of the first reports I had to write, was daunting. And not so much writing it, but taking inquiry, taking phone calls, like, hey, we want to talk to the expert about X. And like that winds up on your desk. You're like, I I'm I'm sorry, you were looking for an expert, sir, that, that you should go talk to Lori or Jerry, like you should talk to me. Um, and in fact, I have a whole talk about this. Actually, my... Um, my secret skills, uh, secret strengths talk uh, is just about this experience of like being called an expert and yet not feeling that you have the confidence to be so. So there's like a steep learning curve to get to comfort there, um, which is true in taking any role, I think. But the thing that was fun about it was I got to help a lot of people, you know, and a lot of customers at scale, right? Think about what would really work validate that with enterprises around the world and then sort of publish good practices from there. Um, I love that. Uh, and, you know, what you reach a point in any gig when you feel like, mm, you know what, I'm doing more internal than I am external, right? I'm not helping as much. I'm not really 
getting the time with my customers as I'd like to. And I sort of hit that point and it was, it was time to move on, but I really enjoyed the time I spent doing it. Um, I did because of the way Burton got folded into Gartner. I never worked on any of the MQs. We would, you know, collaborate a little bit around questions and things like that, but we were, we were kind of on our own little Island of misfit toys. Uh, and, um, it was, it was a great time. Got to do a lot of other things, but, uh, having just recently responded to uh, a Forrester wave, uh, you know, it's still like, I can't get too far away from the analyst gig, it seems. <laughs> One of the things I think about um, kind of that uh, people expecting you to be the expert. So this happens to Jeff and I all the time. We'll be asked to, you know, consult on privilege access management or mm -hmm. uh, access management or identity governance. And it's kind of the, the same kind of scenario where people expect us to know every product, whether yeah. the product can, whether each one of the products can fit their exact niche use case. My feeling is that there's nobody in the world who could answer all of those, answer that question for all the different vendors. Um, and if anybody could, it would be the, the analysts from Gartner or from Forrester or from Cuppinger Cole. And I don't even think that they could, but if they could, they still don't do the kind of consulting that we do. So I, I really, I, I wonder if you kind of feel the same way that, especially as the, the landscape is broadening, there are so many offerings, so many vendors that it's impossible for any one person to kind of know how each product handles each specific use case. And that's, you know, from looking at the Gartner process and how they go about, you know, surveying and, and having uh, products demo to them, it's, you know, you really have to have that kind of framework in place to even have a starting point to kind of gather and stay up with that kind of information. Yeah, I think I think it's possible for someone to know within a given discipline and identity the good practices and the things to avoid for certain, right? So in a in a product neutral way, it's totally in bounds to someone to know like what's a good practice. I think to your point, it is practically speaking impossible to know all of the products in a space like you consider uh strong authentication multi-factor authentication uh, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of vendors there's just no way um and so i think that you know when i've been asked whether i was an analyst or not to talk about hey how's this going to fit my use case you know the focus has always got to be back to what's the outcome you're looking for Let's just start with that, right? And what I find is seven out of 10 times, people aren't 100% sure of what they really want as that outcome. And then the process of working backwards to be like, okay, well, let's break that apart. And what are the specifics that you need and how do you get there? That's more valuable in a lot of times than product A versus product B. Now, for certain products have their differentiation and there's reasons why and why not to use them. But at least in my experience, focus on the outcome and you know work from there has always been more successful because at the end of the day, some of the time, the decision is like, oh, what we have is fine. The way we've wired it up isn't, or the stakeholders we have for the program aren't fully aligned. It's a real different, but honestly better outcome than let's go tear out a bunch of middleware, throw in a bunch of middleware and hope it's all going to pan out in the end, right? Like that's that's not really a great outcome. And I think what's interesting about the maturity of many areas, many products of the many areas in identity is a lot of them are mature, quite mature. And so it is less about a specific niche feature here and there. And to be fair, there are plenty of use cases that call for those things. But in the general case, it's more about, are we clear about the outcome we're looking for? Uh, does the operational or organizational physics of the enterprise get in the way, right? Like distributed versus centralized IT, lines of budget live with the business, not necessarily in a central funding vehicle, what have you. Um, clear executive ownership, is it there, is it not? Like all of those things are a way better indicator of how the program's gonna go than like, did we buy the upper right? you know, product in a parallelogram, or did we, you know, actually suss out what it is we need to do to delight the stakeholder? Yeah, I think you brought up something that I think is really important, and that's losing what you're trying to do because you get so distracted by the shiny thing, right? 
Um, and, and a lot of applications and programs and products out there are like that where, yeah, we can do all these neat things, et cetera, but is that really what you need to do, right? If you're trying to solve IGA, for example, it comes down to provisioning, you know, who has access to what at a most fundamental level. Sure, there's a lot of other things you can do, but if, if you're really trying to solve base use cases and all of a sudden you get distracted by the, oh, we could do user behavior analytics, I, you know, spoiler, that's like a three to four years out for you if, if you're not even doing the basics right. So, yeah. um, you know, trying not to lose sight of what you're trying to do uh, is important. Yeah, and, and the basic plumbing, right? How hard is it to set up connectors? How does the data flows work? Like the real, especially in the IGA space, you know, which is kind of what I grew up in, um, you know, you, you realize pretty fast, like, yeah, there are differentiating features for certain. But like the basic block and tackling, the basics of getting it in place and then running a successful program around that is a better recipe for success than a, you know, a bleeding edge product or super advanced functionality because, well, I mean, we've all used Microsoft Word at some point in time. There's like a billion things it could do, but like most of us use like 5% of them, I feel like. like it's two in a lot of like big IGA tools or, and other products too, not just single out IGA, but like that's not unique to our world. And that's something where you've seen Microsoft, who I feel like has been really on a tear for the last several years. Um, you know, they've adjusted their interface to match what is it that users are doing, right? They get a lot of analytics of the program itself, what menus, buttons people are clicking. So they recently, when I say recently, I think it was within the last year or so, they adjusted the toolbar on their applications to just put the stuff that most people were using to be, you know, more predominantly displayed in the interface. And I think that's... That's something that you know they recommend. They still have the diskette for saving. <laughs> of like, course, always cracked. That cracked me up. It's like that. You know, Clippy is I'm sure somewhere around. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're old school. <laughs> Careful! If you say it two more times, it'll appear. It's like Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I saw someone post to Twitter that they showed their child a, a 3.5 inch diskette, and the kid said, "Oh, use the 3D printer to print out the save icon." Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of awesome. So um, Ian, the first time I met you or the first time I, I interacted with you at all was um, 2005 Digital Identity World and you were giving a speech. I don't remember what the speech was on. I'm sure it was some identity topic that was hot at the moment, but you've been in the space for a while. I mean, and you've been kind of a uh, not to blow smoke or anything, but you've kind of been a luminary thought leader in our space. So that's one of the reasons why we were so excited to have you on the show. Um, and in the last, I think it was five years, you helped co-found um, an organization called ID Pro to kind of better the industry for the IAM practitioner, which is our, our audience, right? The IAM practitioner are the folks who uh, listen to this show. Maybe you could walk us through what ID Pro stands for, who's in it, and kind of what your mission is. So our mission is to promote excellence in the practice of digital identity management. Let me give you a little bit of the origin story for it because it explains a lot of the things that we're doing now. Um, I and, and others who've been around for a while have had some amazing opportunities. Uh, like I said earlier, I've gotten to see the world through this industry. And I've met some amazing people who are now dear and close friends. And I have just learned a ton, both within the discipline, but as just a professional in technology. And I wanted to sh find a way for people to get the kinds of experiences and opportunities that I had. Uh, because not everyone can go to a conference. Uh, not everyone can go to like a burden group catalyst. Like not everyone, you know, gets that travel budget. Not everyone has the opportunity to interact with an analyst or find a mentor or learn technology neutral practices. Often you learn product specific practices. So I wanted to figure out a way that more people could get the experience, the awesome things that I, I was so lucky uh, and so fortunate and so privileged to, to take advantage of. Part two is, as I would travel around, I would talk to enterprises around the world and say, like, how long does it take you to build new identity practitioners? And they'd be like, now, 18 months, three years, earn enough of them. Takes too damn long. It's too expensive. 
right? That was consistent across everybody I talked to, every enterprise, big banks, you know, little higher education institutions, didn't matter. And, and I kind of pointed at that and said, like, that looks like a problem. Do you agree? They're like, yeah, that's a problem. It's like, yeah, someone should do something about that. And everyone said, yeah, Ian, you should do something about that. I'm like, oh, huh, didn't see that coming. Um, and so I was lucky enough to kind of start to socialize this idea. Our friends at the Kantara Initiative uh, helped us incubate this. And uh, Sarah Squire, now it's Sarah Cicchetti, and I co-founded ID Pro to build a space where people could give back, right? Those of us who have been in the industry for a while, a way to share what we know, and a place for people to come and learn and accelerate their time to proficiency, right? Or their time to feeling proficient, which are two different things. But there isn't, there aren't enough practitioners in the market for the need, for the size of the industry. And honestly, I looked around I was sitting, I was in Washington, D.C., where I live, but I happened to be at the International Association of Privacy Pro uh, Professionals Global Summit. It's an amazing event. Happens in the spring, typically, when you had conferences. I don't know if you guys remember conferences. Those were things where lots of people came and didn't wear masks in a space. It was, I know, it's fantasy land. Um, How do you spell that? Con conference? Yeah, conference, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it later. Um, and I remember looking at, like, all of the amazing speakers and all the content. And these were people in a single practice with an organization that helped promote that art, that skill set, those skill sets. I remember sitting in the lobby of the hotel going, where, where's ours? Where's identities? Where, where's that organization that is going to promote us as practitioners? That's going to promote this as a profession. And like that really that did not sit well with me. And I kept thinking about this problem. And I'm like, okay, we got to fix this. So long-winded, ID Pro, long-winded answer, but ID Pro is an organization to do just that, right? It is meant to be the professional association for our industry. It is meant to provide people a safe space to ask questions, to learn from one another, and uh, build material in a vendor-neutral way, a technology-neutral way that people can learn from and really accelerate the time to value for themselves and their own careers. You know, one of the things that um, I think about I am and why I really was drawn to it. So I, I fell into it by accident, kind of like most of our guests do, and probably most people in I am, they're in other areas of business or IT, or they end up working on the help desk and kind of rise up into the I am mm -hmm. state. But I found that it, it has a philosophical backbone to it as well. And that's what really got me interested in. And speaking of that digital ID world, that was the first time I, I heard Kim Cameron speak and go over his laws of identity. And I kind of have been thinking somebody really needs to write the history of our industry, right? It probably, I know it predates Kim, right? I mean, we've had a lot yep. of uh, folks on the podcast who've been, you know, like Jackson Shaw in the industry before <laughs> before it was an industry. So, to the, wait, so you saw me at DIDW in 2005. Was that in... Um... Is that in like the Mountain View area? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Digital ID World was pretty amazing because it was the first conference in the industry, really. And uh, Eric Norlin, who came out of Ping, and Phil Becker were the two folks that put it on, and they're amazing the team. And yeah, I went to a couple of those and had my mind blown in two different ways. One was like, oh my God, there is so much more to learn. Like just the like, oh gosh, the little sliver that I knew and was aware of was just that it was a sliver. And then two, the number of people that were already or also doing this. It's like, oh, wait a minute. There's more of us. Holy crow. Like those two things combined kind of opened a window for me into like, this is how big it could be. And they, it only grew from there, like the number of conferences that we now have in this space, the number of practitioners we have globally. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. There was already the concept of this identity, and you were part of that, right? Nishant was part of that. That was kind of, oh, you're, you're being- modern. I don't know. I mean, uh, 
you may just be confusing us to the people that were at the bar at the end of the night. Like I, you know, it's hard to distinguish at some point in time. Let's, it's not got too far. <laughs> Do you have a favorite identity conference today? Is it Identiverse? Because I feel like ID Pro has kind of taken that on as its home conference. But yeah. are there other identity conferences that you think are are worth noting, you know, assuming that we do those in the future? <laughs> there absolutely are. And, and I think the thing that's important is that there are four different kinds of roles as well, because you have actually a spectrum of events where you have things like Internet Identity Workshop, which I went to the first one and I ended up sitting in between uh, Dale Olds, who came out of Novell. Uh, is at VMware, and uh, Tony Nadlin, who was with IBM at the time. Uh, and I had no idea who they were. Like, these guys are mega huge brains in the industry. I'm like, some kid, like, I don't know. I don't know who these guys are. Uh, and, but that's where uh, Kim Cameron demoed Cartspace for the first time. Uh, and Dick Hart talked about uh, Skip, or the predecessor to Skip, really. And so IIW has been a stalwart in terms of for the people that are really thinking about how standards and the bedrock of the things we build our solutions on really work and pushing idea boundaries. So like IAW, but here's the thing, if you're not a standards person, you may be like, ooh, that seems like a little bit in the weeds for me. Well, that's cool too. Um, in the day, Burton Group Catalyst was awesome. Um, it's, uh, it's different now, let's just leave it at that. Uh, Identiverse is uh, ID Pros here in the States um, sort of home conference, but then you've got Identity North in Canada, which uh, I know people you've been involved with and like really enjoyed. And, and I have not had a chance to go and attend. I very much want to, but then you have European Identity Conference, uh, Copinger Cole hosts, which is great uh, in the EU um, and, uh, you know, continues to get bigger. But then what I find recently and so in 2020, I learned that I don't know, understand how time works. So when I say recent, I don't really know what that means anymore, but I'm going to say like within the last two years, uh, organizations like FIDO and the Open ID Foundation also have events. And I have of late really enjoyed those. Um, and because it's a very concentrated sort of subject, right? It's a, they put up a boundary in the sense of, well, this organization is hosting, so it's gonna be around authentication or it's gonna be around federation protocols or these other things. And listening to people within a subject matter show you the, the richness of what from the outside, you're like, eh, strong off, like how much is there? And then you, you really look into it. You're like, wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things, use cases and detail here. And I, I find that really interesting because at some point you have to kind of sum over some of these functions in the sense of like, okay, well, we're gonna have a, a stronger adaptive authentication solution in this, we're gonna have an IDA solution. And you, you kind of think of them as big block pieces on the slide. And then when you, when you re-immerse yourself at a topic, you're like, wow, yeah, I forgot. There's a lot here. Um, and that's, that's good, right? It's always good to go back and fill up the tanks in the subject area that, you've worked in, but you know, maybe haven't spent time in recently. I feel like that's a good, um, that would be a good article for the body of knowledge in ID Pro, right? What are, what are the conferences that are out there? And I think ID Pro has a calendar. We do. Yeah. So one of the, among the things we do is we try to track all of the local um, IAM user groups in the world. And we're tracking dozens upon dozens. When they meet, we're tracking all the conferences as best we can. Um, you know, online has been a little different this or last year. Uh, hopefully it will be different in 2021, uh, fingers crossed. Uh, and, you know, keeping track of these things, right? Because I, I think the interesting thing that happened in 2020 was the push towards virtual for a lot of events. And on one hand, it made things a lot more accessible. On the other, it kind of, um, it uh, I don't know, peanut buttered a conference through an entire month or a couple of weeks, which made it in some regards a little bit harder to attend, but you could cherry pick the sessions you wanted to go to. So uh, it's a nice balance and change, I think, coming out of 2020. Yeah. And I know I've used that that calendar on the idpro.org website to look at yeah. different things that have been coming up, right? Because there are so many different conferences out there that, you know, I think people are probably familiar with some of the bigger ones, 
but there are a lot of really good small ones. And the thing that I've noticed coming out of, you know, with COVID is that virtualization of those conferences, Mm -hmm. you know, they may have started maybe a little bit rough, but they've gotten really good (laughs) over the last few that I've been. People are figuring it out. And I will be very curious as the year progresses, uh, 2021, what that looks like. Um, Because having, being together with people in a proper non two dimensional space, but a three dimensional space is real different. Um, and I am glad that there's been a bit of democratization of access to content, which is, I think, a very good thing for all of us. Um, it, it's good. I do miss being with everyone uh, and seeing people that I haven't seen in a while, but also meeting new people. Um, and hearing from speakers that I haven't heard from before. And I think that's the thing that I like about in-person conferences is, all right, I'm going to attend this session. The next one, I don't know who the speaker is, but the one after I do. So I'm just going to sit here and like keep this chair warm. And I get to hear someone I've never heard of, never talked to before, and hear something amazing at a serendipity. Like that's a great thing about an in-person event, in my opinion. So. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's very hard to, to replicate the interaction, right, between attendees, guests, et cetera, when you're trying to do things virtually, which, yeah. you know, there, there's that aspect, of, you know, the, the travel aspect, typically these are in destination cities, so you can kind of have So the week we're it. recording this, you realize this would have been Gartner IAM, and yep. I don't know what kind of conditions under which would make me miss a technology conference in Vegas. But we have hit that point where I'm like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be down to go to a tech conference in Vegas. Yeah. I missed that. And, it, and that's a horrifying statement, but okay. All right. Yeah. That's where we are. We'd all be in hazmat suits. So yeah. What stays in the hazmat suit in Vegas. I don't even know how that sentence goes. You know? <laughs> I don't know where that goes. Yeah. That's not good. Not good. Well, maybe this is a good kind of like palate cleanser, right? At some point, you know, it's be like, you know, if, if, you know, let's pick on Gartner. If Gartner IAM next year is the first in-person conference that people get to, people might be excited to actually go again. I don't necessarily have a problem with Vegas. I'm not much of a drinker or a gambler, so I can kind of uh, ignore that kind of stuff. But I sure like, you know, good food and Vegas is a great city for food too. So people watching. Yeah, and great people watching. That's for sure. Um, so ID Pro does a bunch of different things. Um, yep. I know one of the things that has been discussed in the past is around IEM certifications. And I think this is uh-huh. an area that um, is of interest for a lot of different people because there are different organizations that have different IEM certifications. We had Henry Bagdasarian on a few weeks ago from the Identity Management Institute, for example, and, and they've got some. Um, is ID Pro considering anything in the certification space that, that we should be you know looking into as well? Absolutely. Um, but let's start with a foundational, which is one of the things, and you, you, you talked about it, that we have published three issues of our body of knowledge. One of the clear things that came out of uh, the skills survey that we've done for the last couple of years is people are desperate for technology neutral things to learn from. Uh, to understand either their subdiscipline within IAM or the whole practice. And not everybody has access to analyst material. So that really leaves a big gulf to be filled. So we, from the very beginning, started a body of knowledge committee. And so that has been shepherding through content over the last year plus. Uh, So we're just now on issue three. And there's a bunch of content in there that ranges from here are standards that you should probably know about to here are identity architectures to this is sort of the overview of the discipline uh, to things about access certification, which I think is in the pipeline for issue four. Um, And there's a, a, a constant sort of stream of content. This is written by practitioners for practitioners. Uh, and it goes through a really rigorous process to ensure that it is neutral in the sense that it is not codifying one vendor's best practices, but actually looking at what is best for the practitioner as a whole and are, by extension, the organizations that we work for. Now, that gives people a place to start to learn more about disciplines within identity management. We also have had as a goal a professional certification. And our theory was we needed the body of knowledge so that we could test against something, because otherwise, 
pulling that together would be actually challenging, right? We wanted to make sure that the certification had teeth, so to speak, right? Meant something that you really did have a knowledge base to operate on for your enterprise or your customer, what have you. So we actually have a certification committee that has been meeting uh, over the last, I would say six plus months. We've really kicked this into high gear. Uh, we now have a set of what we call knowledge standards, which are essentially here are the areas that you need to know about and to what depth to be a practitioner. And then we will start to flesh that out, start writing questions. The goal, and um, when I hang up with you guys in about an hour afterwards, meeting with the board to actually talk about our FY21 next year, this year, in terms of listener plans. One of the big ones is certification and our push to try to get that out into the market uh, next in 2021. Um, and the big thing for me is I want this certification to be looked upon in the same way that uh, the IAPP has their CIPP or a CISSP, that you know, security and privacy have very rigorous, robust certifications uh, from professional organizations. And uh, we really want the ID Pro certification to, to be that thing. Um, over time, it will branch into, I think, both job persona and industry. Right. So I think we will have a base certification and then have one for architects, one for, say, program managers, have something specific for higher education research, have something specific for healthcare. One foot in front of the other. We got to get the first certification out there. And that is a big goal for 21. Yeah, the CISSP is so ubiquitous. Um, how do you get a certification, any certification to be that um, on the tip of people's tongues? I mean, is it jobs? Demanding that is it creating an industry around it, like an open platform? Is it all of the above? I think it is a little bit of all of the above. And, and I do feel slightly um, like a fraud in answering some of this because I'm an identity practitioner. I barely understand how to run the nonprofit that I started, let alone, you know, what does the body of knowledge mean? And what does the certification mean? And, th and this is the amazing thing is that it is members helping doing this, right? We, we, are very much driven by our members' time and their generosity with that time to help produce this. Now we are bringing in experts who work in certification programs and like build how to do this and do this right. But I think one of the things it's gonna start with uh, is I expect that service organizations are going to use the certification as a differentiator for their people. Right. So you can go into a prospect and say, you know, we have the largest bench of certified identity practitioners in the industry. And what that means is they not only have our methodologies and can bring together our tooling, they also can pull from a base set of knowledge that's been certified by the professional organization for the industry. And that makes them more valuable. I think that will be a component of it. I think we'll see recruiters. My hope is we'll start to see recruiters be interested in this and job postings be interested in this. At the same time, I'm nervous. Right? I want the certification to mean something. I do not want the certification to be a barrier for someone to achieve their professional goals in the industry. Right? That'd be a failure. Right. If we put up a barrier, the whole point of ID Pro is to grow the practice, which means grow the number of practitioners. We have to make, there is more work for all of us than any of us all can absorb, right? There, we need more people. And anything that an organization does to limit or to exclude is not beneficial to the industry. And it's not as part of our mission. And we have to, I have to, you know, one of the things I'm deeply concerned about is making sure we strike the right balance there. How do we make this valuable without making it exclusionary? Well, I think that's something that I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about that because, you know, from a membership standpoint, I'm a member of ID Pro and certifications can be very wide ranging, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just like identity and access management is not everyone's a technical person and I am, right? There's, yep. there is a ton of space for professional and personal growth within IEM. You do not have to be a developer to be an IEM person. Right. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have for certifications is 
you know, how do you establish that right balance of what is the front door look like? And then what are the other doors of that house look like from a certification standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, for certain. And I, you know, the thing that I, in my experience, some of the best minds in identity I know don't have a college degree. They're, they're tradesmen, right? They're journeymen uh, and journeywomen, people that learned by doing over time. And someone gave them an opportunity early on, and then they kept adding success on top of success. And it's those kinds of people that really drive a lot of my thinking of knowing like, look, these are total badasses. And you know, there was no college degree to have for identity, but just not even having one. So it's that threading that needle is going to be a challenge to make it worth something, make a certification worth something, but not make it a barrier. Yeah. And I'll give you a case in point. I don't have a college degree, right? And I've been in the IM space for well, since 2003, I guess, before that, you know, IT and before that restaurants, there were, there were no college degrees for IM, but I didn't know I was going to get an IM until, you know, later on, in, I guess, sure. in my career path, but it, it chooses you. It, it, it absolutely chooses you. I chose InfoSec. I didn't necessarily choose ID admin, right? Yeah. I, 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 you know, administration of access. That wasn't where I thought it would end up, but here I am and I love it. Yeah. I, I mean, to your point about um, there are certifications that are uh, ubiquitous. Uh, back in the day, a Nobel certified engineer, the NCE, uh, or there was the equivalent one in Windows. Like that was a big deal in like the 90s, early 90s. And, um, you know, you saw it everywhere. And uh, I wonder at one point, do, do those things get devalued in some regards uh, because of it? Like essentially just meant like, oh, it's a rubber stamp on, you know, someone who's had a couple of years. And so um, I am very excited for the certification. Uh, I am wondering whether I can pass it myself. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, I also want to make sure it remains valuable, right? That it, it truly does enable someone to demonstrate that I do have a library of knowledge, not only that I have operational experience in, but I can draw upon uh, for the things that are maybe a little bit further out. I know where to get that information. I know how to sort of interact with the community for that. Um, and I think that's the larger challenge ahead for the organization. I think that plays pretty well into what we see from an ID pro um, as, as just a body of people. I know that this, you mentioned the skills survey before, and I think that was done earlier this year, probably right around kind of the, the start of when COVID really started to hit the United States. So um, I'm curious as to, the, you know, what did you take out of that report um, that was recently released? I, I want to say it was like within the last month or so, the kind of the finalized report of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was released um, right around Thanksgiving, so November time in the States. We started gathering responses end of February 2020. So just at the leading edge, if you will, of like, oh, this lockdown thing is going to be a thing, right? And um, what I took from it was the, okay, as an enterprise, we're going to have a remote workforce that we never expected. And I know many people had large struggles about just getting IT equipment and infrastructure in place, like network connectivity in place. But then the very next thing I think was fairly universal was, all right, what is the most effective controls we can put in place to, to protect our stuff? Whatever that industry is, whatever that data is, like what's the basics? And far and away, multi-factor authentication was that thing, right? People who had plans for MFA uh, quickly dusted those things off. I think that was a very clear indication that we saw from the survey. The thing that we didn't see in the survey, and I think this is a function of when we asked, was around customer identity and access management. I think had we asked the same questions in the late summer, we would have seen people saying like, yeah, so we had three-year digitalization strategy and digital transformation plan, and we basically were given four months to get her, uh, and part and parcel of that is SIAM. Um, that didn't show up in the skill survey. So when we run it again in uh, February-ish of 2021, I kind of expect to see SIAM in the top enterprise priorities and that MFA is considered more of a done thing, right? Like that's lowered down in the priority stack because 
a bulk of enterprises already tackled that and they're on to oh crap we're digital only or like we have to significantly augment our brick and mortar with a digital strategy and siam as part and parcel a couple of things that i thought were interesting too were around um you know the the years worked in an in industry i think was one of the questions and how predominantly veteran <laughs> the respondents were and i think the respondents were a combination of not only ID Pro members, but maybe some non-member or kind of public responses. Yep. And I think some corporate responses as well. But I think from what I remember of the statistics, you know, more than three quarters of the respondents had been in the IM space for at least five years or more. Off, off the top of my head, I think that's about right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, given where we've been talking about getting, you know, newer talent, you know, newer expertise, uh, you know, developed from an organization standpoint, there is clearly an opportunity to get people interested in IAM, right, as a potential career path. Um, And things like the body of knowledge, certifications, having, you know, what I, what at least what I perceive is a very open and inviting community uh, will do a lot to help people who are not as familiar with IAM right? They could be developers and, you know, they have some coding expertise, for example, but they've never really considered IEM as kind of a path for that. Uh, It could be project managers, program managers, you know, people who are interested in the more (laughs) businessy, you know, aspects of IEM. I think there are certainly opportunities to grow the number and available pool of younger, you know, less experienced workforce into, identity practitioners of the future as well. For certain. And I think the other thing that there's an opportunity uh, to do is make our industry uh, a more diverse and equitable one. And so uh, our uh, peer organization, Women in Identity, who's all friends of ours, and, and we've um, you know been uh, closely aligned with the work that, that Women in Identity are doing around this, right? How do we bring a more um, diverse workforce to bear? How do we identify and uh, really work to eliminate bias in the services that we are building? Uh, because if, if as an enterprise, we're rolling out services to be used by everyone, then they need to be serviced and managed and built by people that reflect what everyone looks like, right? And 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 that's our local communities, that's our global communities. Uh, and so, you know, I can't say enough good things about, uh, about women and identity and their efforts to help drive this along, because it's not just about growing the pool, right? We also have to make sure that we grow that pool in a diverse way so that it really represents our communities. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, having run this podcast now for well, more than a year, I think this will be like episode 75 or something like that in, in our, in our uh, hopper. Um, I see the stats of who's listening, where they're coming from, et cetera. And, you know, the, the people who are listening to the show are predominantly male, something like 80%. I have no idea how I can grow beyond that. So I'm looking to those types of organizations for ideas on how do we become more diverse? How do we get, you know, listenership to be more reflective of the organizations that are listening, you know, the the companies that we're working for, you know, those sorts of things. So I think it's, it's important to, you know, try and try and be more equitable, as you mentioned, you know, throughout the entire process. Um, I think the other thing that was interesting too, from that skill survey was, you know, uh, it was a question around, when do you feel proficient in identity and access management? Mm-hmm. And is it, I, I think more than half of the survey respondents were somewhere between two and 10 years, <laughs> which yeah, is a big yeah. range, right? When do you it feel is. proficient? Do you ever feel proficient, right? I mean, there's yeah. so much to learn. That question, so I wanna to touch on just something you said and then I'll answer that, which is, um, you know, you should reach out to Kay Shepard if you haven't. She's the US ambassador for women and identity. Uh, I've known her for years. She is awesome. You should have. You should definitely have her on the podcast uh, and talk about uh, just the, the interesting things that, that her experiences and women identity are doing uh, regarding diversity in the workforce. So like fully endorse, I'll help you get that done. Um, With regards to uh, uh, feeling proficient, we asked that question very specifically, which is how long it take you to feel proficient? Because being proficient and feeling proficient are two different things. Um, And this causes much rancor in the board, uh, the ID Pro board, because of the almost nearly 30% of people who respond to say, I still don't feel proficient. Full disclosure, I am one of those people. 
Uh, and to me, it's a great thing that a third of our respondents, I think it's 28% this year uh, off the top of my head, uh, uh, say that is to me, that's a reflection that we are a growth industry and that we are adding constantly to the areas that a practitioner could know about. I say could know about. Doesn't mean you gotta know everything about everything. It's not possible, it's too big of a space. But the fact that we are a growth industry means that there's always going to be new things that you could go research and learn about if you wanted to. There's new kinds of programs you could go do if you wanted to. So to me, I love that. Um, now, I think to your point, yeah, the two to 10 years, the bulk of like the answer, which means the truth is probably around about eight years is my guess. That's an awfully long time, right? That's an awfully long time. And I want to push that down to like five, if we can sort of get that way. Like you're not going to be a Jedi Knight overnight, to, despite what the movies might actually tell you. You just don't go to a swamp and like, do push-ups with like Nishant on your back and suddenly you're an expert in IGA. Like that, that's not how that works. Um, but at the same time, we can't spend, like you can't be a hermit and like go off and live in a cave for a decade and come out and be like, I now fully understand access management. Like that also is not the path to productivity. So, I, you know, one of the things that I find is so fun about ID Pro is that our, our online community is a really great space for people to ask questions. Like, real practical like has anyone done x y and z with like these two products or even without products just like these are the constraints i've got how would i go about this like super useful um because the other takeaway from the how long did it take you to feel proficient question is it pretty much means that there's a very few number of people that actually feel that proficient and probably are proficient which means we're all trying to figure out it as we go right and there's something i don't know comforted about that, which is that you're not alone in your journey in this industry and that you've got a piece of the puzzle, a peer's got a piece of the puzzle. You know what? Someone who works for one of your competitors in identity has a piece of the puzzle. And here's a place you can go and talk to those people. And I think that is really powerful. You know, Ian, I was going to ask you the question around um, what are some what are some things that folks who are listening, I am practitioners can, can do to help ID Pro? First thing that comes to mind, of course, is join ID Pro. Um, but I also was thinking just from a mentoring perspective, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've had some great mentors in, in your career. Uh, I'm sure you've also mentored others. One of the things that came to mind was just some of the great women that we've had on the show. You know, fellow luminary, Eve Mailer, shout out to Eve. Um, but just looking at the, the list of uh, some of the great women that we've had on the show, in the past few months, Julie Smith, Rebecca Nielsen, Mary Ritz, Mary Berg, uh, our own Maida Gonzalez from Identribe. Um, these folks are not only able to, you know, kind of pass on that, that wealth of knowledge that they've built over decades plus uh, careers, but also to kind of be role models. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think all those things are important, but I guess I'm wondering from, from your perspective, what are some what is your perspective on mentoring that next generation? So um, we'll, we'll take us in two parts. So I think one of the things is a starting to start help our practitioner, our fellow practitioners is look at goodidpro.org, see if there is a meetup in your local area. If there is, see how they're they're how active, you know, where they're, you know, where you can get involved. Because building that local network is really powerful. Uh, and, you know, it helps build some of the connective tissue among practitioners, which we need to grow the industry. Uh, and I think then if you do choose to join, which is awesome, um, be active in our online community. Uh, we have a Slack environment, which is a lot of fun. It is a really safe space to ask some tough questions. Uh, and, you know, I talk to people who are like, wow, I in a matter of minutes, got answers to questions that I had been struggling with. Or we could see the industry coordinating around, hey, look, there's a, a, a case in point. Um, there was a vulnerability in uh, XML comment handling that had impact on SAML. And very quickly, people who represented their their employers are like, yep, we patched this. Nope, it's next week. Like, it was very quickly a triage. And so 
even if you didn't want to feel comfortable asking questions, you can learn a lot just passively and watching what's going on. Um, and then uh, to your point around mentorship, um, it doesn't have to start formal or complex, right? Which is why I come back to get active locally. Because even if it's a, I, I, you know, I can answer a question or two and like we can meet and have coffee. That's where real lasting relationships come from. And like, I, I am far more right now interested in figuring out how we build those from the, the grassroots level. And then, yeah, as people go and progress, there are amazing people to learn from and they are universally very generous with their time. Uh, I think this is one of the things that I have heard from members is I was surprised how willing people were to talk uh, and to spend some time. Um, and so, you know, I do think mentorship is incredibly important. We ask in our skills survey, what's something you wish you had uh, to be uh, more successful? Top answers are vendor neutral material. So really the body of knowledge peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities and mentorship opportunities. Those are the top three. They've been consistent for the last three years. Um, our need to connect has never been more vital, you know, and to do that as best we can in a COVID era, that's an awful big challenge. But, you know, organizations, whether it's your local meetup or it's ID Pro in a global sense, help there. It doesn't solve everything. It's not a, you know, it's not the silver bullet, but it is a great start. I think it's an opportunity to people for uh, to to take it to take ownership over their career as well, right? Don't wait for a handout or for someone to come to you and say, "Here's what we want to do." If this is something interesting, go out, you know, research, get involved with the community. I'm glad you mentioned the ID Pro Slack channel because I'm not much of a contributor to it from my you know typing. But I'll tell you, I learn a lot just reading the different challenge, you know, different challenges that people are facing, you know, the different comments, et cetera. So even if you're just a lurker, kind of like me, there is so mm -hmm. much to be had for that. So I definitely, you know, agree that if if you're if you're an ID pro and you're not taking advantage of it, do it. If you're not an ID pro, consider joining. I think I don't know if that's a perk or not <laughs> of joining or not, but um, oh, yeah, it's definitely sure. it's definitely a great spot to um you know, commiserate, collaborate, and celebrate, right, with other ID pros. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for certain. Um, Ian, you've been so generous with your time, and I know that we're getting close to uh, when we want to get things wrapped up here. What I thought would be interesting is to start the new year off here, and I guess in our cases, end the new <laughs> end, end the year, is to talk about some of the predictions that you've had around the next 10 years of identity and, and maybe more of a you know, rapid fire format here. I know that there's a lot of different technologies that are out there. Mm -hmm. And this is loosely based on the talk that you gave at Identiverse in 2020 uh, around the next 10 years of identity. Maybe we can start with WebAuthn. Um, that is yep. something that really kind of hit early 2020 when Apple finally kind of joined on board and being, you know, supporting with their Safari browsers. Um, where do you see WebAuthn going in, you know, not only the next 10 years, but let's maybe in the nearer term, 2021 and maybe 2022? So I think long-term WebAuthn will become the, an, on equal footing to social sign-in and in, in Siam's environments, which is to say, like, it's a kind of magical experience if I could just look at my phone and then get signed into an app. Like, that's, that's sweet, right? Who wouldn't want that? Uh, WebAuthn helps broker that now that, you know, you do have more ubiquity in terms of availability in the mobile OS platforms. Um, I think what we'll start to see is a little bit, so, the, and the reason why I say that I think WebAuthn and Social Sign, will, they'll kind of achieve a certain parity is that, Although social sign gives me a nice sign in experience, I click a button and basically I'm in an app. Um, I, you know, we're seeing enough concern about the social networks and the use of data, uh, either both provided or derived, that you know, people are looking for alternatives. That if I can get that same kind of experience, you know, I look at my phone, I'm in the app uh, through WebAuthn, that's going to be a real boon, right? Not to mention all the security benefits that go along with it, not to you know, mention all of the good things that come from it. So in 2021, what I expect around web auth then is we'll see a lot more people kicking the tires in mobile platforms and in their apps and figuring out ways to integrate it in a sort of lightweight way uh, as best they can. And that'll start to make that ceremony, the way that that sign-in experience works, become more and more prevalent. 
And that'll pave the way for mainstream adoption. Do you consider sign in with Apple a social login? That's a very interesting question. I think no. Insofar as uh, the data that is available, so let's look at like wires. The data that you get if you are an I, if you are a relying party there is very minimal. First name, last name, email. That email can be pseudonymized, uh, and you only get it once, uh, which is very interesting. So there isn't like a constant flow of attributes from Apple to the people that are consuming signing with Apple. So in some regards, yeah, it's provided by a third party provider and. Although Apple doesn't really have a social network per se, it does have some things that feel like it, and you will see it on top of the side of Facebook and Google, what have you. Um, but from an implementation perspective, it looks pretty darn different. What about standards like OpenID Connect, Skim, SAML? Um, it, well, first of all, SAML's still dead in 2021, <laughs> as it's been. For sure. SAML is going to remain uh, incredibly useful and dead. Uh, and um, that's not going to change. What's going to change is that what we will see in this next decade and probably the next five years is that OpenID Connect is the de facto federation standard for most people, uh, and that along with it, all of the supporting technologies, so OAuth, the Jose Suite, et cetera, um, and then I think we'll see Skim from a IGA perspective being the, the language of choice. Um, I still keep hoping that, you know, to resurrect SPML, but that's apparently not gonna happen. Um, and so as people move platforms, that's where we're gonna see the migration from SAML to OpenID Connect. You're not gonna see it before that. Like no one is really gonna get funding to do a big re-implementation of their single sign-on because if it's working, don't mess with it. And no one's de-supporting SAML anytime soon. That's going to be with us for the rest of the decade. But when you move platform, there's the opportunity to uplift your, your standard specs and your standard stack uh, to something a little bit more modern. And that'll require coordination with all those applications too, right? That have been maybe standardized in SAML. They're going to have to figure out moving over to OpenID. Yeah, you are coordinating a bunch of parties doing work. They're like, but it works. Do we have to mess with it? Like, this is why... Um, Renovating your house is more expensive than building a new one, right? Because you're like, well, if you tear up the wall, I've got no idea what I'm going to find in there. Like you start mucking around with your SAML federations, like you don't know what you're going to find. It's going to be a mess. What about, so this is the question that Nishant passed on last time. He gave us a next question on this. I didn't know that was a thing. Can I do that to the next one? <laughs> you may. And that's why I'm posing out as an option. Sweet. Sovereign identity and blockchain. I feel like we've been uh -huh. hearing about this for the last couple of years. It's the next big thing. I haven't seen an enterprise use case for it. You know, I think maybe personally there are some opportunity maybe in citizen ID or something along those IDs, maybe banking or, you know, healthcare or maybe education, but I don't think it's gotten the traction yet, um, even in those spaces. Where do you see blockchain or sovereign identity going in the future? So I think I'll, I'll talk to the sovereign side of things, which is going back to like the first Internet Identity Workshop. User centricity and user centric identity has always been a thing, right? Put the user in control of their interactions and their information. This is not rocket science from a concept. Making it real, that's a bit of a different story. Uh, and so to me, the there's a lot of similarity around things that we have been trying to do and chipping away at it uh, for quite some time, for over a decade. Uh, I think the thing that is interesting, that is, sorry, that is not interesting to me is the storage mechanism, right? So back when I was talking about identity relationship management, everyone's like, oh, so you're saying we've got to use uh, object and network databases for everything? Like, is it like graph databases, like the way to like solve identity? I'm like, I don't care about the backend storage. What I care about is the kinds of things that we can represent in the use cases we can unlock. I don't get super excited about different kinds of storage mechanisms. I think what I have seen is people moving away from oh, this has got to be all about blockchain to verified credentials are really kind of interesting and it's a different way to present, to get the outcome that people want to be able to do, which is present something that uh, is verifiable and validated in a manner that the individual has uh, analogies they understand, a ceremony that they can engage with to exchange or to present these things, and a nice technology stack that actually uh, helps engender trust. Um, a lot of this is not new. 
right? This is card space, uh, but we're redoing it in, in, in a different way. And I think that's important. We should explore these kinds of things, um, but I'm not gonna wager uh, any specific sort of like where things are gonna get to in the next 10. I'm gonna go more than Nishanta, which is I tried to answer the question. Absolutely. So uh, score, score one for Ian in the Nishant versus Ian. Uh... Uh, battle, well, let's just call it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about deep fakes? Where do you see deep fakes intersecting with identity? Um, and I'm, I'm most likely talking here about fraud situations where um, an issue may come up where, you know, here's, here's what I think is I think deep fakes, you know, are a good social engineering mechanism to do things, not necessarily trick you know, the technical underpinnings of authentication, although there is certainly a potential for that as well. I'm curious as to your thoughts on deep fakes and identity. I think the thing that I'm, I think one of the things that is coming is an increase in proofing and progressive proofing in our SIAM and citizen identity worlds, especially SIAM. I think government has understood the need for remote in-person proofing. I think SIAM is a little bit more challenging, right? Where I have a consumer scenario and I want to give them some value, but I also don't want to, and to do that, I don't want to put too much friction in the process. However, I also do need a degree of assurance that, you know, this is a legal entity to whom I am speaking. And so proof of liveness is going to be more and more important. And as we slide more proofing into the progressive profiling or progressive proofing processes, that's where proof of liveness is going to be important. And so, yes, there may be a fully synthetic social identity. You may even have synthesized uh, video for that synthetic identity. Uh, the thing that's gonna matter is detection of liveness as you are starting to bind that synthetic identity to a legal identity. And that's where the rubber's gonna meet the road. So when you say proof of liveness, I'm thinking implants and how do you prove you're alive? Well, maybe it's something you know within you, whether it's an RFID chip, which we've heard about, right? People implanting an RFID chip and then doing the old scan on a badge reader or whatever it may be. Um, where do you see implanted identity going? I think we're going to see it as an outgrowth of wearable, right? So we are in a, I would say, more comfortable time for wearables. So smart watches, but also rings and things like that, where mostly NFC, some payment, but then also, you know, it's a sleep analyzer or some other functions along with it. And I think that's reasonably normalized in, let's say, uh, some cultures globally. Uh, obviously, it's not a global thing yet, uh, just because of cost. I think what we'll then see is a natural progression to things like smart hearing aids. Uh, we are starting to see things like um, replacement cornea or uh, smart uh, contact lens. I think that's going to be the progression. Um, I am in, in a reasonable time frame. And reasonable, I'm saying, is like, let's say five years. I think implantable, um, from a personal perspective, uh, we all struggle with Bluetooth headphones. Right. And I'm just thinking like, oh, my God, like, are we going to go through the same sort of clowniness with, you know, embedded in or implanted that we do with like Bluetooth headphones? Like, this is just a bad outcome to me. And I don't want it to be a semi-permanent kind of thing. So I think it's going to be more like we'll see a lot more wearable, even integrated into clothing. Uh, and then implanted will start under certain conditions. And I, I think it really will be around hearing and sight uh, and going from there. There will always be the biohackers. There will always be the folks who are like, I've got a full Raspberry Pi inserted into my left thigh. And like, look at all the cool things I could do with it. Um, that's cool. Like that really pushes boundaries. But I think for the next five years, it's going to be wearable, more kinds of wearables, and then moving into some of those applications of um near implanted, let's say, kind of scenarios. So we're not going full cyberpunk in 2021, huh? <laughs> Go for it if you want to. Like, there's all of that stuff that's out there. Um, I think mainstream, probably not. Obviously, I think there's the privacy concerns about having some kind of chip inserted under your skin. But I think it's all going to come down to trade-offs. I mean, if there's enough value to do it, people will do it. If you could insert a chip on my heart and detect before I have a heart attack that Something's going wrong. And I think Ian's point is great is that you could probably achieve a lot of that with wearables. So in other words, if I don't want to be tracked, 
I could take it off. Uh, but I think if the trade-off is there to do an implant, um, I could see people signing up for it. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I think as much as I love the bleeding edge, there's some things where I'm like, hold on, hold on, let's back up for a sec. I still don't have a consistent here in the States digital driver's license that I can present in lieu of the plastic card. So before we pull vault into, I have, you know, an embedded digital passport and early warning system on my insulin levels. Let's, let's peel that back and go like, what is the utility that the most people can get from something? And then that's going to show you where the addressable markets are going to be. And so as a, as a service provider, right, as someone who is consuming identity service, I'm thinking about if I'm going to add a technology to my stack, what addressable market does it unlock for me? So it's like, oh, wait a minute, I should support things around digital driver's license because it gets me this entire state. You know, it gets me uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, for example, um, or Utah, or what have you. Okay, that I can measure versus how many people are going to have the fully implanted digital passport in the next five years. And you're going to make those trade-offs, right? As a business owner, you're going to be like, does this unlock a new segment of my stakeholders that I can go address? And I think we're going to find there is low hanging fruit still in the more pedestrian, if you will, use cases and identity that will unlock more value for vastly large numbers of people. And, and, you know, it's some of those mundane cases, which are like kind of exciting. Like, yeah, from a plumbing perspective, I get it. But like, from a stakeholder perspective, I'm really excited for those kinds of use cases. How about managing expectations? I think uh, <laughs> because the future bit. has so many different things you could do. Right. Um, all right. Well, I think that's probably a good spot um, maybe to close out this conversation. Cause I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and, and Ian, thanks again for joining us before we get going here. Um, any final words of wisdom or, or not that you'd like to impart upon the listening audience? Um, if you're starting out in the industry, Never connect your demo provisioning system to the production Unix cluster and then delete someone's home directory. I'm just, just a tip, just at, at, you know, at random. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say if ID Pro appeals to you, if the opportunity, you know, the idea of having the opportunity to meet with like-minded uh, people around the world, or at least people in the same industry who are approaching problems in radically different ways, and you want to learn about that, hey, join ID Pro. Um, but if nothing else, we make a lot of material free over time. We want to grow this practice, in this industry, uh, and we'd love to have you involved. Uh, and otherwise, it's now 2021, uh, our listeners. 2020 was a strange year, obviously. Um, 2021 may still be strange. Um, the important thing for our practitioners and our listeners to know is that you've never been as needed as you're needed now. Um, identity services is a growth industry. Uh, there is so many different kinds of applications that need your help. Uh, they're out there. Uh, and I think this is a great place to be and a great time to be here. Here, here. Fully agree. Jim, how about yourself? So we are recording in early December. We'll publish in January. So I hope everybody had a happy holiday season. Whatever holidays you celebrated, including Festivus. And we started off uh, pre-podcast talking about potential airing of grievances. And I think we kept it pretty positive. Uh, but whatever works for you. And I hope everybody has a happy new year. Yep. Hope everyone enjoyed the holidays. I think this is, if not the longest, definitely one of the longest episodes that we've recorded and no better one to do it and kick off kind of the new year with. So appreciate it, Ian. I think with that, we're going to go ahead and leave it. We're going to have a bunch of links to a lot of the things we talked about uh, today, ID Pro, um, you know, connections to LinkedIn, uh, some of Ian's uh, talks that he gave at Identiverse, those sorts of things, and, uh, you know, ID Pro itself. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close it out. Hope everyone uh, had a great holiday, and thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you all in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.